Welcome to this symposium at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia on the White House and domestic policy making. Those of you who are watching this on C-SPAN or through the Miller Center website will be interested to know that there are four sessions like this one entirely, and you can find those um, online by going to the, to the C-SPAN or the Miller Center website and searching for them. I'm Michael Nelson. I'm a professor of political science at Rhodes College. I'm a senior fellow here at the Miller Center. And it's my happy uh, privilege to introduce not only this uh, session, but also the individuals who will be uh, the principal discussants during the first half of this program um, to be followed by more general discussion among the scholars and among the former White House officials <clears throat> seated at the table. Um, first off, Stuart Eisenstadt. <coughs> Excuse me. Stuart Eisenstadt currently heads the international practice at Covington and Berlin <coughs> LLP, but the reason we're so happy to have him here is that he was the domestic policy uh, advisor to President Jimmy Carter. Um, since then, he's gone on to serve in the Clinton White House in a, in a variety of capacities, including ambassador to the European Union. He remains engaged in Holocaust-era Holocaust related issues and has written a much praised book coming out of those activities, uh, Imperfect Justice, Looted Assets, Slave Labor, and the Unfinished Business of World War II. We also have um, with us for this session Bruce Reed, who uh, is currently the president of the Democratic Leadership Council. He's here because uh, during the eight years of the Clinton presidency, he was first uh, deputy director and then uh, assistant to the president, chief domestic policy advisor to President Clinton, famously uh, associated with the landmark Clinton administration uh, welfare reform act of 1996. Prior to that, uh, deputy campaign manager for policy in the Clinton-Gore campaign in 1992. Prior to that, uh, chief speechwriter for um, Senator Al Gore. We're also happy to have with us uh, Jim Pinkerton. Jim is uh, known to, to, to many of, of us uh, currently as a frequent contributor to the Fox News Channel, as a frequent poster at foxforum.com. He worked in a senior capacity in the Huckabee for President campaign last year. But again, the reason we're so interested in having him here is the work he did in the first Bush presidency as deputy assistant to the president for policy planning. And then um, finally, um, among our former White House staff people, um, Margaret Spellings, not only a former White House staff person uh, as deputy policy advisor during the first George W. Bush administration, but um, rarely, not unprecedentedly, but rarely among White House staff people went on during the second term to serve as Secretary of Education um, and currently is President and CEO of Margaret Spellings and Company. Now, leading the discussion uh, during this 90-minute this, this, uh, session will be my colleague uh, and fellow political scientist, Lawrence Jacobs. Larry is uh, director of the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance in the Hubert H. Humphrey Institute at the University of Minnesota, Minnesota and sort of continuing that Minnesota Democratic um, politician pedigree, he also is the Walter F. and Joan Mondale Chair for Political Studies and Professor in the Department of Political Science. Larry has published 10 books, including, by my count, three this year alone. I'll just mention a couple of them, even though they all deserve mention. Uh, one is uh, Class War, question mark, what Americans really think about economic quality, inequality. And also this year, uh, a book called The Unsustainable State, published by Oxford University Press. So without further ado, Larry Jacobs, um, take, take the chair. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we've been talking uh, quite a bit about the making of policy. Uh, obviously, the presidential campaign matters a lot. There are uh, important uh, promises and commitments made during that campaign. You come into the White House. They've got to be followed through on. You've got party interests and other sorts of interest groups in Washington pressing uh, 
uh, for different kinds of policy initiatives, and a whole host of other sorts of influences, of course, including real world changes. Once the president makes a policy, the next step is how to sell it, how to promote it, how to build support for that policy outside the White House itself. And that's what this session is about, to think about how it's done, who does it, who's the audience, and to what effect. Mr. Eisenstadt, let's start with you. Who is it that uh, takes the ball from those of you who design policy and sells it? Well, first, the, the president has very few uh, real powers under the Constitution of the United States uh, beside being Commander-in-Chief. It's no accident that Article I of the Constitution is about the powers of Congress. The, the President's real power on the domestic side is his power to mobilize support, to use the bully pulpit of the Presidency, uh, and to be, in effect, the salesman-in-chief to rally the public and, ultimately, Congress behind his initiatives. In order for that to be effective, uh, the President has to make sure that he has a White House staff that is organized to back his initiatives. Uh, he's got to have an Office of Public Liaison that is built into the policy process, not an afterthought to it. For his chief priorities, he's got to make sure that his outreach effort is part and parcel of the development of the policy. So when the major policies are announced, there is an outreach strategy. We had a number of flaws in the first year which prevented that from occurring. They were corrected in the second year, and we had a much smoother sailing thereafter. But the first year is critical because that's when the public uh, forms their impression of a president. And let me uh, talk about the organization of the White House in that respect. The first decision, which uh, Jim Cannon, my uh, deep friend and close friend who was uh, in this position with President Ford will remember. Uh, President Ford initially had no chief of staff when he came in, sort of a reaction against the centralization of power under uh, uh, Ehrlichman uh, and Haldeman. President Carter followed that on. Uh, he adopted a spokes of the wheel organization in which six or seven senior aides had equal access, but no chief of staff to organize and coordinate the policy and the politics, the outreach and the announcement of, of policy. And this was a serious mistake. This was not done by happenstance. Uh, Stephen Hess from uh, Brookings had written a book arguing against the centralization of power in the White House, and, and Hess and Carter uh, I put the two of them together. Uh, President Ford actually learned in the second half of his presidency uh, the importance of having a centralized chief of staff to organize outreach as well as policy. Uh, and uh, a fellow named Dick Cheney became his chief of staff. Uh, one humorous anecdote is the day we came in from uh, uh, the inauguration, there was in the chief of staff's office, uh, occupied by Hamilton Jordan, but he was not given the title nor the responsibilities for it initially, uh, a broken bicycle wheel. Uh, with uh, the uh, wheel all broken, and Dick Cheney put a note saying, don't follow the spokes of the wheel. <laughs> uh, we should have followed that advice. We did ultimately, but it cost us badly. Uh, indeed, uh, because there was no setting of priorities by the chief of staff, we had a multiplicity of priorities, and the salesmanship job, therefore, became more difficult because we were at one and the same time trying to sell welfare reform, hospital cost containment, a major energy bill, the Panama Canal Treaty, uh, and a whole host of other uh, hospital cost containment, a whole host of other initiatives. A president, to be effective as salesman in chief, has to be able to have a very tight discipline on the priorities he's going to set, and the chief of staff is where that starts. Again, that was done later in the administration, and Vice President Mondale played a role at the end of the first term in setting those priorities. It was not done initially. So your public outreach has to be coordinated by the chief of staff to be part and parcel of the policy development process, not uh, as an afterthought. Uh, indeed, our first public liaison saw it as her job to represent the interest groups of the Democratic Party to the president rather than the president to the interest groups. That was changed uh, by the end of the first year when Ann Wexler was brought over from the Commerce Department. 
and Ann, who's a consummate professional, did a truly brilliant job. And we actually ended up, Larry, with uh, a congressional quarterly rating of, of uh, success in our legislation higher than John Kennedy's and almost equal to that of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, because we did learn, and Ann was excellent at, I think, creating the first modern outreach effort, uh, getting constituency groups in for briefings that I would do on the domestic side, uh, Brzezinski on the foreign policy side, the president would come in, we would have uh, East Room uh, uh, events, uh, and they were sort of given their mission to, to try to sell our programs, and it worked very effectively, but only after the really very difficult first year in which none of that was in place and we paid a, a frightful price for it and having too many initiatives without having the public uh, salesmanship part built into the process at the beginning. Uh, I would like, if I may, uh, to, uh, since I, I was unable to, to join the rich conversation yesterday, talk about for a minute the campaign promises because really salesmanship starts in the campaign. Um, Jimmy Carter was uh, a Democratic president sandwiched in between eight years of Republican presidents on one side and eight years on the other. Uh, he was uh, not coincidentally a moderate Democrat. If he had been a liberal Democrat, he wouldn't have gotten elected, uh, even with Watergate. Uh, and so it's important to understand that when he came into office, <clears throat> there was a mismatch between the expectations of a highly liberal democratic congress who were, were looking for a revival of the great society after eight accidental years of Nixon and Ford. And instead they got this moderately conservative <coughs> southern democrat who was in effect a new democrat, the first new democrat before Paul Songus and Bruce, if I may say so, before Bill Clinton. Uh, that is to say he was fiscally moderate, if not conservative, socially liberal. Uh, on civil rights, uh, on environment, uh, and on a whole variety of, uh, of, of other issues. And this was a new type of Democrat. Now, the problem with campaign promises, which are a predicate for selling your program <coughs> as president, is not what the public thinks. The public thinks that presidential candidates just uh, promise whatever they have to to get elected and then ignore it when they come in. It's the opposite. They are very serious about their campaign promises. The problem with campaign promises is not that they're so often ignored. It's that they're fulfilled, but that they're made under suboptimum conditions for policymaking, under great time pressures, under great political pressures, with a small campaign staff, without the kind of interagency review you have when you're president, without the kind of economic and budget data you would like to have. Uh, they're often slapped together under enormous political pressures, and then you have to live with them when, when they come, uh, when you come into office. There are real implications for breaking campaign promises, and let me give you two examples, <clears throat> which all the salesmanship in the world couldn't handle. Uh, toward the end of the 76 campaign, with the race tightening, as Jim again will remember, a very large lead we had, 27 points, uh, was withering to one point. Uh, Texas became a very key state, and oil and gas are very important issues in the state of Texas. And I drafted uh, at the uh, urging of uh, Governor Dolph Briscoe, the then governor of, of uh, Texas, a letter from President Carter, which was faxed in this oily process that we had back in that ancient time, uh, to uh, the campaign plane, Peanut One. Uh, which said very explicitly, if elected president, I will deregulate natural gas, which was a huge issue in Texas, because natural gas had been regulated since the time of Harry Truman. And I wouldn't say it was the only reason we won Texas, but it sure didn't hurt. When we put together the uh, energy package, and I'll talk about that more later under the lessons learned, Jim Schlesinger, there was no Department of Energy at that time, he was energy advisor, convinced the president to abandon that campaign promise on the ground that John Dingell, the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House, and Scoop Jackson, his companion in the Senate, were dead against, as were the uh, Democratic uh, interest groups, uh, deregulation of natural gas. It was an anti-consumer type of thing. We had a meeting in the cabinet room, which I can unfortunately remember to this day, I was the keeper of the campaign promises. 
And the president was serious about campaign promises, so much so that he said, your job during the transition is to organize them and publish them so that we can be held accountable. And indeed, we were. Uh, this was uh, published in a CCH yellow book. We used to call it the yellow book, the sort of Mao book. Uh, and uh, the president at this, uh, at this meeting with Schlesinger, where he was saying, we really shouldn't do this deregulation. It'll kill our whole energy bill turned to me and said, Stu, you're the sort of keeper of the campaign flame. What shall we do? I reminded him of the Dolph Briscoe letter and the importance of it. And then in a, a sentence I wish I had never uttered, I said, well, I guess if Jim feels so strongly about it, uh, if there's one campaign promise you can ignore, perhaps it's this one. Now, this turned out to be a catastrophically bad decision because in the House of Representatives, more than two-thirds of whom were Democrats. Natural gas deregulation offered as a substitute for the Dingle Bill failed by one vote. I mean, it would have passed by 25 or 30 votes if we had simply said, this is what we believed in. When it went to the Senate, natural gas deregulation passed easily. That one item held the whole energy bill up, which had been our number one priority, for 18 months. It created a cloud over the president's capacity to handle Congress, and it's a good example of what happens when you abandon campaign promises. A second example was the so-called $50 rebate, uh, which was part of our stimulus package, uh, and the president was persuaded, and here perhaps with better economic reasons, that with inflation beginning to rise, that this is one we should abandon as part of our stimulus package. The problem is that Senator Muskie, then head of the new budget committee, had created an extraordinary third budget resolution to fit this in after it had passed the House. And he learned about the President's decision to abandon it, which was done at the uh, instance of the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, by reading the ticker. Um, so if you're going to abandon a campaign promise, for goodness sakes, lay the groundwork for it and have a very good explanation, because otherwise you'll pay a very stiff price. Ms. Spellings, let me uh, pick up on one of the uh, comments that Mr. Eisenstadt made, which was about the importance that um, the promotion and sales part play in setting your priorities in policy making. The uh, administration of George W. Bush uh, was very skilled in setting priorities and then following through with a sales uh, plan. Who, are the, who, who did that? What were the mechanisms within the Bush White House that created that coordination, the priorities, and then the, what seemed, at least from the outside, in some areas to be a fairly effective handoff. Yeah, I think um, the, our watchword was discipline. And uh, I, I'll credit my colleague Carl Rove with thinking through and routinizing a calendar that had such discipline to it that really selling the president's policies, uh, that was everybody's job in the White House. The legislative shop, of course, public liaison, all of us in the policy shop. And there were very little uh, while we certainly had areas of responsibility, it was absolutely an all-hands-on-deck sort of uh, approach. I can remember uh, the very first week of the presidency, we spent the entire first week talking about education with uh, events in and out of the White House, in and out of Washington, and uh, one of the things that I think we th sometimes think about when we sell public policy is the public side of this and strategic ways to message this, particularly out of Washington uh, in, in states, in key states with key members of Congress and the like. But uh, th what the president does with his private time. So a couple of the first things that, that uh, Bush did when he came to office literally in the first week is have uh, George Miller and Ted Kennedy and John Boehner and Judd Gregg and the whole fam family over for the movies to watch uh, uh, the, the movie, I can't remember the name of it, but about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I, I, it was a surreal moment for me to, to watch Senator Kennedy and President Bush sit on the front row of the White House movie theater watching this movie about Senator Kennedy's brother, literally feet away from the Oval Office, and this, the, movie, the entirety of the movie virtually takes place in the Oval Office. So I think these sorts of important personal moments, uh, these relationship building moments, are as important as the, the public uh, campaign or public uh, 
you know, effort to engender support. Um, I, and I, as, as I said, I, you know, discipline as much planning as, can, as is possible. So the way we did it, the way Carl did it, was we would look at a calendar of, say, t about two months, which in White House time is an eternity. And we would, you know, sort of phase things. So education would be on week one and week three and week six. And in the intervening period, you know, we'd do Ann Wexler-like activities and public liaison things and relationship building and on and on. But it was very much a tactical kind of exercise, uh, not a haphazard um, sort of this is our priority, everybody do your thing. It was very much a, a planned out, disciplined operation. Bruce Reed, uh, when you think of your experience in the Clinton White House, would you describe it as uh, disciplined and focused, following a strict calendar? <laughs> well, uh, yes, in this sense. Uh, the, uh, President Clinton discovered when he got to the White House that the, um, that the, the best organizing principle for his, um, uh, for his agenda was the State of the Union. And uh, so our entire effort every year was organized around that speech for months ahead of time as he prepared, as the White House prepared the President's budget. Um, uh, we had the State of the Union in mind um, uh, because that's the one chance um, where the President gets to do what he could do in a campaign, which is set the agenda for the year. Um, and uh, uh, our State of the Unions ended up being uh, quite long as a result. Uh, I think in 1995 we set the, the modern record with an 89-minute speech. Um, uh, but it was uh, uh, important because it was, a, it was a, a chance to speak in an unfiltered way directly to the voters, um, which is any president's greatest asset. If he can make a connection with the voters on his ideas, then that is something that he can sustain for quite some time. And the great advantage of the State of the Union is that uh, Congress is generally down. They don't, uh, you know, historically, um, uh, they haven't done much work in, in January and February, so we always viewed that as our greatest opportunity to get a leg up on them. One of the innovations from the Clinton years was the pre-State of the Union rollout. That's right. Uh, 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 we realized that precisely because Congress was um, uh, out of town and not, not doing anything, that um, we didn't have to save the State of the Union for the night of the State of the Union. Um, and so with each successive year, um, we started uh, leaking out pieces of it earlier and earlier. And um, I think by the end, we were taking advantage of the Christmas holiday. Um, and um, it was, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the White House is the, the, the center of, um, uh, of the journalistic and the political universe. So you can get attention for whatever you're doing, and you might as well um, uh, use that um, in the best possible way to roll out some ideas. Thank you. Mr. Pinkerton, um, there was a sense that uh, George H.W. Bush, not so comfortable with the television camera, not, you know, on the Clinton level or uh, the level of uh, Bush 43. How did you all think about salesmanship with that president or in terms of how to organize the White House to get their message out? <clears throat> well, um, we had one huge benefit back in the Bush 41 White House. We had Roger Porter, who had probably the only domestic policy advisor president who had written a book on domestic policy advising to a president before he got there. Uh, um, but uh, I think it's fair to say that Bush 41 was not a natural television uh, aficionado. But I think that the real dilemma that the Bush 41 domestic policy operation had, and it was charm to hear Stu Eisenstadt say that Jimmy Carter was preceded by eight years of Republican presidents and eight years, <laughs> succeeded by eight years of Republican presidents. We were in there too. <laughs> we, we were nine through 12. <laughs> Story of our life, you know, Rodney Dangerfield. Uh, um, I worked on the, I started working for Bush 41 in 1985 in his political action committee and then his campaign. And so I was there for the entire period from 85 to 92 uh, to observe these things. And, you know, during that time, Bush 41 was called a wimp. That was a standard epithet in the media. The, uh, um, 
And we always said, you know, look, the real problem we have here is not, he's certainly no wimp by anybody, anybody. he's a war hero, family man, oil man, everything, is he had the dilemma that he was not entirely comfortable with his campaign and what he was saying. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that Bush 41 was, was and is a, a conservative in the sort of European sense of the word. He's sort of a custodian and sort of a steward and sort of an aristocrat and, again, fought for his country at a young age because that's what you did. But it wasn't like he was sitting around reading Conscience of a Conservative or a Choice Not an Echo or, you know, or, or Ayn Rand or, or something. <laughs> and, and so he was very aware that just that his faction of the party, sort of the Rockefeller wing of the party, for the, 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 the Prescott Bush wing, uh, was in the minority. And that you know, he had been sort of beaten up in Texas you know, by you know, the Harris County Republican ladies at one time or another. I mean, not literally, but I just I realize we're speaking for the record here. I've got to <laughs> emphasize this. Um, but they could. But they, but they could. <laughs> <laughs> and so he and it come at, and he had a terrible 1984 campaign was very, very demoralizing to him. I mean, I think uh, some political scientist did a study and he said he actually had the absolute worst press coverage of any nation, national politician ever. And I think the, the key factoid was like he had, didn't have just a few positive stories, he had zero positive stories written about him in 84. And, I mean, the, Reagan was sailing off into the, in, into the, into the you know, pantheon and the media would then turn on Bush and say, well, look, who's this? Runt coming along behind him, and, and so on, and uh, I can remember, you know, we used to we used to joke. Does does anybody realize that that Bush forty one is actually taller than Reagan? Mm -hmm. Nobody would believe it, and we'd say, look, here's a picture, and say, ah, you, you cheated, you 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 you, 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 you photoshopped it. Uh, um, so, in, into this context, you know, Lee Atwater, who became the de facto head of his political operation, said, look, you've got to win over the conservatives, and so. We, we made a real effort to get Bush 41 on the right side of the tax issue, the Grover Norquist no tax increase pledge, uh, which it, under extreme pressure and over the objections of the, the OVP back then, uh, we persuaded Vice President Bush to sign the Grover Norquist pledge in April of 1987, and that was a fight. You know, and, and I think, the, okay, that's the good news, is that we thought we had created sort of an exoskeleton, if you will, of campaign promises that would lock, you know, and I was, fair to say, I was from that sort of Jack Kemp ideological wing of the, inside the campaign, and I don't think we would have gotten him nominated in, against Jack Kemp running to his right and Bob Dole, who had sort of the moderate establishment uh, Senate side of things. Uh, we, we wouldn't have gotten through. Um, so that's, that's the, the good news. The problem is when you have a situation like that where the, the, he gets nominated doing one thing, and then the, the, the general election campaign, I think, was much more the true George H.W. Bush. It was a thousand points of light and kinder, gentler, and we had this program called, yes, Youth Entering Service, which to my knowledge never had a, so much as a policy paper behind it. It was just sort of a notion, we're going to do this. And it became points of light and national service. I mean, all these things that are now familiar. But then you get to the White House, and this is where I, I, I believe that um, the Bush 41 White House was destined to anticipate uh, Professor Jacob's very smart book of a, a decade or so ago, uh, you know, Politicians Don't Pander. You know, uh, 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 they, when they get in, they say, okay, what do I really think and what do I really think ought to be done here? And now it's your job not to keep, help me keep my campaign promises, but to help me do what I really want to do. And uh, John Sununu and, and more to the point, Richard Darman uh, convinced President Bush, Bush 41, that a budget deal with a tax increase was just decisive and necessary. Now this was, I mean, again, this read, I mean, if there's one phrase where people remember, read my lips. I mean, if there's one thing that we just beat in a political sense over and over again in 1988 was, we're not going to raise taxes. Who knows what else we'll do, but we'll not, we're not going to raise taxes. And then there we were. Now, talk about no sales job. I mean, the, the sequence of how this happened was, 
Roger, if I remember this right, they, they posted a, a, a memo on the White House press office bulletin board saying that he will be open to tax revenue increases. And, and uh, it was like April of 1990. And, uh, you know, this Governor Sununu said, well, yes, we're for, we're for tax revenue increase, but that doesn't mean a tax increase. See, we'll cut the capital gains tax, and that'll make revenues go up, and uh, that'll, be, that'll be our tax revenue increases. Well, I mean, you know, Sp Speaker Foley and Majority Leader Mitchell weren't going to sit still for this. They made us say, over a bloody month, say you're for a tax increase. So we did. And that, you know, the rest is history in terms of, you know, Louis the Fifteenth is Dalyuge's, you know, descending, descending on us. But I mean, all the, I mean, I, 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 you know, Sarah Wexler to this day remind, is still seen as the ideal of what a public liaison operation should be. Um, so, but if, if you're if your public liaison officer and your congressional affairs people are involved from the get go in the formulation of the policy, then there's a decent chance you might get somewhere with it. But if it just comes because the president and the chief of staff and the budget director decide to break the most sacred campaign promise you've ever made, then your chances of success at anything other than the tax increase, which you can get done, but uh, your own political future is, shall we say, uh, jeopardized. And then we, that's where we fall into the Eisenstadian category of we get disappeared from history because people don't even remember we were there. <laughs> well, I very much remember uh, because, uh, for one thing, uh, when he was CIA director, uh, he briefed President Carter and elect uh, during the transition. And I was the only staff person involved and uh, gave really world-class uh, briefings. I would say uh, to Jim, <clears throat> with 12 years of Republicans after Carter, that it would have been 16, even with that, had it not been uh, for Ross uh, Perot uh, running. And I say that, uh, Bruce, knowing that, that Bill Clinton is, you know, the great uh, political icon of our time. I mean, has enormous political skills. But I think that the conservative tad in the country had still not exhausted itself. And it's not at all clear, even with, uh, with Bill Clinton's fantastic political skills, that if Perot hadn't divided the conservative vote, uh, that, uh, you know, President Bush wouldn't have been reelected. But I think Jim emphasized, again, the point I was making in my presentation of the risks of appearing to back off of a campaign pledge. Uh, it was more visible, for sure, with the no tax pledge of, uh, of President Bush one than it was natural gas deregulation. Uh, I'd like to turn, however, to, uh, Larry, a, a similar situation, and that is when you make a major priority something that wasn't part of your campaign. Because a campaign really is the opportunity as the candidate to lay the groundwork for being the salesman in chief when you're elected. If you suddenly pop up with major initiatives at the beginning of your presidency that weren't part of that p political landscape during the campaign, you also run into problems because you have to jerry build a political constituency that's not prepared for it, both the public and the Congress. And may I just give you two examples? One was the, the uh, so-called hit list of water projects that uh, very much fulfilled President Carter's notion of dealing with government waste. Um, he had been perhaps the only governor in history to block a Corps of Engineers project, uh, the Spruill Bluff Dam project, when he was governor. He saw these as wasteful and inefficient, which in many cases they were. But this touched uh, the nerve endings of almost every major member of Congress. And because it was not part of the campaign, when it popped up at the very outset of the presidency, it caused a furor in Capitol Hill and diverted attention from the major priorities we were trying to sell. It created uh, a new novel uh, issue which, again, complicated our public outreach. And the second and more significant was the first energy package, the moral equivalent of war. Now, looking back at that, it was prescient, uh, prophetic, when one looks at where we are in our energy picture today, uh, and very courageous. But by making this the number one domestic priority, 
uh, at the very outset of the president, presidency where the fire said chat uh, reminiscent of FDRs. Um, when that had not been a major issue in the Carter Ford campaign, uh, energy was not a major issue. Uh, the, the notion that there was an urgency about doing it was not part of that debate. And then suddenly popping that on was courageous, but it was uh, politically very difficult. And it's one of the reasons, among others, uh, that it took 18 months to get uh, this very difficult package passed because there hadn't been a, a sort of public, uh, you know, preparation uh, for this, and you had to jerry build a public outreach strategy without, at that point, having Ann Wexler on board. Thank you very much. Ms. Spillings, I want to uh, bring in another element to this discussion about how presidents sell their policy, and that's the press. And the press, there's a, a kind of a two way street between the White House and the press. On the one hand, the press is dependent on the White House for information, it's the number one beat in Washington. And uh, that dependence is an opportunity. On the other hand, uh, obviously the White House has got, as you eloquently put it, its own sense of the story it wants to tell. Um, and that's very different from the situation that Bruce Reed mentioned with the State of the Union where you're unfiltered. Now, uh, President Bush was uh, famously described the media as the filter. How did your White House think of the press and how to manage that two-way street how do you both respect and, and earn the respect of the media uh, by playing by their rules while still using it to achieve the purposes that the White House needed? Well, I, I think a couple of things, and I, I do want to credit uh, Bruce and, and, and President Clinton. We, we stole a page from his book on the leak your State of the Union nuggets before you go in and, and talk again in the aftermath. So uh, I, I think one of the things that we use most effectively is get the heck out of Washington for starters, uh, you often got a much, much more favorable uh, response in, in regional media, big and small cities, uh, you know, taking members of Congress along, those sorts of things. But, you know, I, I would say that the bulk of this, the sales job on policy was done not in Washington, but, uh, but out in the, in the hustings. It's very interesting if you actually look at the audience numbers on press coverage. The viewership of local news is higher than viewership of national news. Absolutely. Um, and did you target particular local news people? Uh, sure. I mean, it was not particular people so much as particular places that we knew we needed to be for a variety of reasons. Influence on the Hill, battleground state. I mean, it's no accident that uh, you know President Obama is going to you know Arizona, New Mexico, you know these swing and key places. I mean the the. Purple states, you know, are the purple states and will continue to be, and that's where they're going to spend their time. That's where President Bush spent a lot of time. That's where President Obama's going to spend a lot of time and so on. So, I mean, places that matter and places that you need to, you know, be thinking about always. He didn't spend a lot of time, you know, selling the message in Texas. George W. Bush uh, didn't need to. I want to pick up for a second on something that Stu said about the the issues that are not part of the campaign and how, how important that is. And for us, that was immigration. And I'll talk more about this maybe when we talk about the lessons learned. But, you know, in, in 2000, Bush, uh, that was, you know, just something that was close to his heart. But, you know, as, as incendiary as that is now, it was virtually a sleeping dog then. And, you know, Pete Wilson had gone through his sort of thing in California learned from it, and we did the total opposite in Texas. I mean, school, English only, and all of that stuff, we never had any of that sort of issue. And, um, you know, we it, it began to work on it very, very, very early in the administration. It's one of the most complicated policies because it implicates every single council, National Economic Council, the National uh, Security Council, and of course, domestic policy. Every single agency is implicated and so forth. And then 9-11 came and we stopped. And, uh, you know, obviously we, in, in 2000 and 2004, we didn't talk about it much on the campaign trail. And then to try to build a constituency around and against largely Rush Limbaugh was impossible. Thank you. Um, Mr. Reed, uh, the Clinton White House, uh, very skilled in terms of its communication operations, uh, very capable folks in the press room, the press secretaries, uh, a string of them who, who I think are well respected to this day. Was there a tension 
between both the energetic effort to uh, push kind of a, a, a political line, a kind of a spin uh, coming out of the communications office versus the, you know, perhaps the need of a press secretary to earn the respect of the media to, you know, give a Joe Friday just the facts, ma'am, uh, sort of approach. Did you see a tension there or, or not? Well, I think there's always a tension uh, between the political uh, advisors and the facts. <laughs> uh, uh, let me make a uh, let me make a couple of points about uh, about marketing in the White House. First, I have to take issue with Stu and correct the historical record. You forget uh, that in the '92 campaign, the anti-Washington mood was so strong. It wasn't all George H. W. Bush's fault, but it was so overwhelming that without Perot in the race, we would have run a Reagan-style landslide. And if Perot had stayed in the race the whole time, it's entirely possible that President Bush would have finished third and, and Perot would have given us a run for our, our money. Um, but um, uh, look, I worked for the greatest presidential salesman of all time, but he would be the first to say that really at the end of the day it's all about the product. And the, you know, because the White House ha the, and the bully pulpit is, um, uh, um, is what everyone is watching, we assume that that is the White House's great advantage. But in my view, the greatest power of the executive is not selling, it's doing. The, the president has the ability to take actions that back up his policies and that sell his policies better than any speech or uh, any press secretary or any spin operation can do. And it took us a while to realize that. Um, but. Uh, after the 94 elections, when um, we didn't exactly have a compliant Congress, uh, we realized that um, they weren't going to do anything that we wanted to do unless we forced them um, to, to pay attention. And so we developed an aggressive strategy of doing executive, uh, executive orders and other kinds of executive actions um, to force their hand. And uh, the one, one that I worked on the most, uh, Welfare reform, we did, I would say, probably half a dozen executive orders on child support enforcement, another half a dozen on welfare reform. And ab about um, uh, the middle of, of 1996, Republicans who had been um, trying to stop us from being able to pass welfare reform finally just threw up their hands and said, well, if you're going to do it anyway, um, we might as well go along so we, at least we can share some of the credit and be at the signing ceremony. Let me just explore this idea with you on... Um President Clinton um, deciding that the doing is really what it's about and using executive orders. Because the notion um, that Stu Eisenstadt mentioned about the bully pulpit presumes uh, you know, going through the usual legislative process. You put a proposal up, you work it through uh, the usual legislative process where it's passed and then the President signs it or vetoes it. But what you're suggesting is really circumventing that entire process. So is, is your conclusion then that, that you know, presidents uh, really are fairly ineffectual using the bullet pulpit, that the executive order? No, I, I'm not saying circumvent it. I'm saying that in politics, the most important thing is to win the argument. And you can't assume that just because you have a bully pulpit, and you, it is a great advantage. The, the party that has the, the White House has one person who's setting the message for that party, and the other party has you know, several hundred people in Congress and around the country who are all trying to get on the same talking points and can't do it nearly as, um, uh, in, in, in as disciplined a fashion. But at the end of the day, you, you, have to win the, uh, you have to win the argument, you have to convince the country that you have the right idea. And, uh, and it's not as though your pul pulpit goes unanswered. We faced hundreds of millions of dollars of advertising against our health care plan, hundreds of millions of dollars of advertising against our tobacco bill. Um, uh, and um, the advantage of the uh, of the bully pulpit erodes over time. It's it's a great um, when you're the only one talking about your ideas, they sound great. But when the other side starts to bring up some um, different information, your advantage erodes a little bit. And uh, that's why it's very important for the president and the White House team to focus early on on the quality of their product because, uh, and you, you, you know, you, every time a White, a White House um, says, um, you know, I think we have a communications problem, that is a red flag that says your product stinks. Um, or if you hear that they're going to relaunch an initiative, that means 
the Titanic is coming. <laughs> it, there is, there, it is impossible to relaunch a bad idea. Yeah. I suggest again that, that I think if you, if you look back at how uh, those presidents who are perceived to be the most successful, who won a second term, uh, Reagan, Clinton, um, Bush. Bush II, uh, they all had a person in the White House in Rove's case, he wasn't formally chief of staff, but certainly with Leon Panetta, John Podesta, uh, with uh, Jim Baker for Reagan, who was brought in even though he was the campaign manager for Reagan's opponent, uh, uh, Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush. Uh, these were people who were highly experienced in Washington and who had the capacity to pull together policy and politics, salesmanship, and substance. Um, and organize the White House in that way. That's what we missed in the first year. Uh, Bruce was a very good domestic advisor in, in every respect, but was enormously benefited by having, of course, a president who was world class, but also having an organizational structure that pulled that together. And, and, and the same, again, with, with, uh, with, with uh, Reagan, uh, where Jim Baker was a master at that, and, and with Karl Rove. There's no substitute for that. In the modern presidency, you simply have to have one person who's designated to pull all of that together and, uh, and organize the outreach and the policy so that it becomes integrated. And I think that's been a major lesson from the Carter presidency, and we see it in subsequent presidents. You've got to have the coordinator, the Karl Rove type, or you know, the Clinton White House, there were several who took that role. Uh, Mr. Pinkerton, let me uh, come back to this issue about the press as the filter. Um, Marlon Fitzwater, uh, famously remarked um, uh, about the uh, media and the, and the White House relationship, it's both our friend and our enemy, I'm paraphrasing. Um, did you, thinking back on the way the media treated you, uh, treated your administration um, or the administration you worked in, uh, more as an enemy or as a friend? Um, to be honest, more of an enemy. Um, I mean, you know, we have to go back to the Austrian regime of when CBS News and the New York Times were dominant and Rush Limbaugh was a minor, I and mean, he'd come online by then, as a, to use a phrase that didn't, wasn't used in 1990 or so, but he started, um, and as I, he supported Bush in 92. He was a very anti, strong anti perot voice, you know, not that it did us any good, but nonetheless, uh, he hadn't reached his full potential yet, I guess. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, I think it was understood that the, again, another word not used then, and now you, you, the mainstream media just were, had, you know, were not for Bush. They, they liked him well enough. They, they, they were sort of personally fond of him. There, I mean, uh, 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 Maureen Dowd wrote a piece, probably for the New Republic, about 1988 or so, or 89, about the Ralph Lorenization of America and how you know, reporters sort of, and the, the, the chattering classes in general, all sort of secretly wished that they were Prince Charles and living in an estate somewhere. And so they kind of ad identified with Bush 41 on that score a little bit. They sort of admired him, but they didn't vote for him and they didn't really agree with him on, on, on policy. But let me just uh, push on that because okay. I, I, yeah, there is the left right uh, issue about the press, but I'm wondering more about the institutional issue. Uh, you've talked about the way in which the Bush White House uh, was in some ways encumbered by the president's fumbling of his campaign promise on the no... Uh, fumbling wasn't quite the word I used, but okay. Right, right. <laughs> I'm being diplomatic. Um, and, 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 but you know, you kind of look at what I think most economists would say at this point, and I think there were economists at that point who would say, hey, this was an important part of the Clinton success later on in, in creating budget uh, surpluses, and that's not been uh, credited, and it really wasn't much part of the uh, press coverage then. I just mentioned that as the example, though, of ways in which the ways in which the White House is organized, its institutional, you know, the, what Stu Eisenstadt's been talking about, its coordination of both developing policy and thinking about sales, and, and the no tax pledge is an example of that. Does that disadvantage uh, disorganized White Houses with the press? What disadvantage? The, the fact that you've got uh, a president who's not skilled with the media, who doesn't have this kind of uh, sense of the importance of maintaining uh, these campaign promises, the political repercussions of, of ditching out, and the way in which the media is going to have a feeding frenzy on this kind of uh, backtracking. 
Right. Uh, I mean, let me just associate myself with something Stu said about the importance of personnel. And he mentioned one name in particular, uh, Jim Baker. You know, I mean, I think that if one were to identify the thread of successful policies through the 12-year period from 1981 to 1993, one would say, well, okay. Reagan's domestic policy was pretty effective, and who was, who was running things back then? I mean, not running things, I mean, Reagan was running things, but who was the prime minister? Jim Baker. And then, strangely enough, in the Bush 41 era, the domestic policy kind of turned south, and the foreign policy was an astounding success between the reunification of Germany and, and the, the coalition that <coughs> evicted Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. Well, where was Baker then? He was at the State Department. So, you know, one person uh, can make a huge difference, and whether he is available or not uh, 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 does make, and he did have a, a canny sense that even if the press doesn't really like you and doesn't, didn't vote for you, you can still make them your ally, and you can still get things done, and you can convince them that, you know, you're, it's, if, if they don't support you and write nice editorials about you, that the crazies somewhere will take over and that'll be bad for the country. And you can appeal to sort of their, you know, David Broderian institutional sense of we got to keep some stability here. And so, so Jim Baker's our guy and we got to stop Newt Gingrich or somebody from, you know, who I'm a fan of, by the way, but nonetheless, in that cosmology, Baker could say, if you don't support me, Gingrich will run the country and, you know, we'll, and that will be bad. So um, you, you can use them, I mean, or you can make use of them on that. And, and by the way, the Bush 41 White House, when it wanted to, even on sort of more domestic issues, could be effective. I, there was a Supreme Court confirmation. What the guy's name? Thomas, that was it, Clarence Thomas, yeah. <laughs> and that was a case where the Bush 41 White House pulled together pretty well, and we did a pretty good job of getting something through uh, in the, uh, about the most adverse circumstances in the pre-media breakup age you can imagine. Larry, but just one last point that Jim really raises. I think presidents will be most effective as salesmen on things in which they really believe. And you can have all the organizations surrounding them you want. They have to really believe it. And, and one example that I had in which I actually worked uh, as a private citizen with uh, President Bush One's uh, White House was on selling uh, the Congress, a reluctant Congress, uh, uh, controlled at that time by Democrats, to give him the authority to send troops in uh, to Kuwait to oust Saddam Hussein and I helped get a coalition of Democrats together to, to work with that and still have a picture of the uh, President Bush uh, thanking me for that, but that's not the point. The point is, this is something he really believed in. He was very effective in selling a reluctant public and Congress on that and getting a coalition of Democrats and, and, and Republicans for what initially had been a very unpopular but very necessary operation. And uh, when you believe something, a president can be a much more effective salesman when, than when he feels it's something that's foisted upon him. He has to do it uh, for other reasons. Actually, that's a, a very uh, helpful segue uh, to another set of issues, which is how effective are presidents at this. Uh, you, uh, Mr. Isaac, had opened up by mentioning that while the president obviously has extraordinary constitutional authority and powers, particularly in foreign policy, and national security, their bully pulpit, their ability to mobilize the country is, is perhaps their greatest strength, particularly domestically. And I'm curious, you know, we've got um, administrations uh, represented here who've had a variety of experiences. The effort to barnstorm the country on social security and introducing partial privatization, the health care effort, uh, the effort to reverse the malaise in the country using the Christ of Confidence speech. These are all kind of historically notable examples of presidents investing a lot in this promotional effort, the salesmanship part, and it not working. Is that, are those exceptions, or is that really a, a clue that maybe we're um, overemphasizing or exaggerating the power and the influence? Ms. Spellings. I, I just want to, because I was actually going to mention that on top of Steve's comment. I think, you know, the, the president personally if the president is per personally very familiar, very committed, very knowledgeable about an issue, that matters. Uh, to the good, it mattered, in my case, on education. I mean, President Bush, you know, whenever we prepared remarks or talking points, he just, you know, he knew the stuff. 
and he took off and he felt it in his heart and people could tell that. That's, that was also true with Social Security. And uh, we have a, an expression in Texas, when the horse dies, get off. <laughs> and uh, we didn't get off the dead horse soon enough, I guess. But, um, but the point is, you know, sometimes the president is the one that is, is, you know, taking the microphone to good or bad, and we're, you know, running the play that has been called. But does that tell you then that we're, uh, we have an exaggerated sense of the power of, of the pulpit or not? I mean, you mentioned Social Security, the, the horse died, I mean, and the president didn't get off. Was it because just he still liked the horse? I mean, I, I, I think he was a true believer, yeah. uh, and I think he, uh, we'll get into this in the lessons learned stuff, I guess, maybe, is that the whole timing of the issue. I mean, I think in hindsight, we learned that we should have, you know, opened the second term with immigration, not Social Security, and, you know, it just, it was too complicated and wasn't to be, but, but he was highly committed to it and that was that. Larry, if I could just add, the three issues you raised, the 77 energy plan, the, 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 the health care plan in 93 and 84, and Social Security are all domestic issues. I mean, the presidents don't have that much, as Stu says, as Richard Neustadt said, you know, they don't have that much power. Uh, on foreign policy, it's different. If you can invoke national crisis, uh, I mean, look at Jimmy Carter and the Iran hostage thing. Uh, you know, you can go way up and get a lot done if it's foreign policy. Mr. Reid, do you agree that presidents don't have that much power in terms mm -hmm. of domestic policy? I think presidents have a lot of power. I do think that we, uh, uh, the political system um, and the coverage of White Houses dramatically overstates the importance of marketing messages, messaging spin, and and undervalues the importance of product. I think the job of a president is not to talk the country into things that it desperately does not want to do. Um, the job of the president is to try to figure out a way to get Washington to take the country where it needs it and wants to go. And um, so, I mean, we had, we had enormous political talent in the Clinton White House. We perfected the planned leak, we invented the war room, we had the greatest salesmen, but um, uh, the, there are, in a, in a country that, um, that wants a lot of action to solve its problems but is deeply skeptical about government's ability um, to, do, to, to run a two-car funeral, as my old boss used to say, uh, that's a very difficult tightrope to walk and it's, it's, it's primarily um, an intellectual and a policy challenge. It's not, um, it's not a marketing one. Let me expand the conversation. We've got Roger Porter over here eager to jump in. Well, one of the striking things is that Ronald Reagan's name has not been mentioned yet in the discussion. He's arguably uh, the most successful president we've had in the last 50 years in terms of transforming the country. And he was a remarkable communicator who linked up a set of ideas and a product with a capacity to sell it. One of the ways that he did this is he had someone, Michael Deaver, who introduced something that subsequent presidents have followed, which at the time was called the line of the day. And the idea behind this is that people cannot focus on many things simultaneously with success. The president needs to use his powers to the extent that he has them to get people to focus on what he wants them to focus on. And Deaver was extraordinarily successful in creating events and photo opportunities and presidential speeches and travel to where he would go so that people had an idea of what Reagan wanted and the content of the proposal. Let me give you two examples. The first thing is that Reagan said he wanted to reverse the rate of growth of federal spending, the rate of growth of federal taxes, the rate of growth of federal regulation, and to reduce by half the rate of growth of the money supply in order to bring double-digit inflation down and generate additional economic growth. He gave this message over and over and over again, very consistently produced a set of plans that um, were, the initial set were optimistic to be sure, um, but they, they did create an environment in which he could take um, 
a Republican Senate and a Democratic House that was somewhat reluctant and passed the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1981 and the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981, two of the most striking landmark pieces of legislation. Reagan felt deeply about tax reform. He thought that the tax code needed to be changed. Jimmy Carter had tried it. Gerald Ford had tried it without success. And when he wanted, in the run-up to, I remember we were preparing the 84 State of the Union Address, and Reagan wanted to have in there that he was going to go for fundamental tax reform. And Jim Baker and others said, look, you mentioned the word taxes, and people are going to think you're trying to raise taxes, because we had gone through the 1982 uh, a tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act, which had been a major tax increase in, in the wake of, of the big deficits that had emerged, the 1984 Rose Garden Compromise, which included another tax element. Reagan ended up raising taxes 12 times while it was in there. But he said, if you mention the word taxes, you're going to get killed. Reagan said, OK, well, um, I get to give the speech, and it will go in there. But I will modify it to say that um, I'm instructing the Secretary of the Treasury to prepare a plan that will be delivered to me in December, on December 1 of 1984. It'll be after the election, and then we'll do it in the second term. He was relentless in the first two years of his second term in talking about tax reform. Everywhere he went, I remember he was going to North Carolina, and Jesse Helms said, um, called and said, uh, I don't, our, my people down there don't care about tax reform. I want you to come and talk about this. And Reagan says, I'm coming and I'm going to talk about tax reform. If you want to be on the stand, fine. If you don't, that's fine as well. <laughs> um, I'm going to do this. And he pulled the political system kicking and screaming to the notion that we are going to have fundamental tax reform. Now, the plan that he advanced was dramatically modified, ultimately, when it got into Congress. He had, to, he had to do an enormous amount of negotiating to get it through. But we did get, the last time we had a, a, little, a fundamental change in the tax code was the 1986 Act. And that was because Reagan was determined and relentless in pursuing that and had, in fact, a plan whereby he was consistently holding people. Now, let's take the second example. What happened with respect to the read my lips, no new taxes? <clears throat> Presidents, like all of us, are prisoners of our experience. And George Bush's experience as vice president is that he had seen Reagan deal with a deficit problem that had emerged after the 1981-82 the, uh, recession as bringing together a bipartisan group of Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate administration, and negotiating a deal. There had been the 1982 Gang of 17 negotiations that produced the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act, the Budget Reconciliation Act of that year, We'd had another um, bipartisan negotiation producing the, what was called the Rose Garden Compromise in 1984. When the stock market crashed in October of 1987, Jim Baker, who was at the Treasury, again put together another bipartisan negotiated package. So we now had three examples of where a Republican president would deal with a Democratic Congress in pulling together a bipartisan deficit reduction package. Bush tried in his first year to solve the deficit problem by doing it all on the spending side. And he got about 60% of what he wanted through. And then as the economy started to slow and the deficit numbers started to rise, his budget director and others came in and said, you are going to face a doubling of the deficit if you don't do something. So he announced that he would um, deal with this on a bipartisan basis, checked with the House and the Senate, and we put together a bipartisan group that was going to do it. His initial inclination was to try to do it all on the spending side. But that had never been done before. 
because all of these other compromise packages had included a spending restraint component, spending restraint component, and a revenue component. His Treasury Secretary told him, well, Reagan managed to raise taxes by not changing marginal rates. When people think of the income tax, they think of their marginal rates. They can accept some on the gasoline tax increase or closing a loophole here and there. You can agree to have a revenue component in it as long as you hold the line and say you're not going to do it with respect to the top marginal rate. Okay. And as a result, he got he he said the only way that I will do this if is if the Democrats will agree to budget caps on the spending side, which is what produced and, and President Clinton to his credit did not throw them overboard, embraced basically his, his, uh, his predecessor's policies and put them in place. Bush's problem was that he didn't prepare the groundwork. He didn't explain to the country clearly enough why he was doing what he was doing. And as a result, it was interpreted fairly as a reversal of his pledge without any groundwork being laid as to why you need to do that. And as a result, he got severely uh, criticized and damaged himself politically. Let me, Stu Eisenhower, let me uh, turn to you uh, to comment on this. You, you had started off talking about the importance of, of the policy and the sales being integrated together, not kind of coming up with a policy and then down the road developing a sales strategy. Is the story uh, that we've heard from uh, Roger Porter and Jim Pinkerton about what happened with, with uh, Bush 41 on the new uh, tax pledge an example of how not to do things? Uh, well, yes, it is. But uh, we've all tried to be frank about our own failings. And as I mentioned, uh, popping a major uh, comprehensive energy bill on the country was another example of not having laid the groundwork. Now. We ended up passing three major energy bills. We broke the Gordian knot on pricing of crude oil, which had been controlled by Nixon and Wage and Price Controls, and by natural gas, which had been controlled since Truman's time. We got alternative energy, conservation, sin fuels, solar. We had the whole package at the end of the day. But it was not until the second and third energy packages that the groundwork had been politically laid with the public that this was really critical to the, to the public. They did not understand. Look, in 1977, there were no uh, huge run-ups in oil prices. They had occurred in 73, 74, but that had diminished. There were no gas lines. Uh, we did not perceive, as we should have, our dependence on foreign oil, uh, notwithstanding the, the boycott in 73. And so these are all examples of good policies, of policies that if you check the box, they were the right policies. The President Bush one was right to do this, to, to combine uh, the tax increase with spending cuts. And uh, the, the uh, policies that I'm suggesting as well, I think, were the right ones on the box. But that's not what being president is about. Now, we learned that, and the president ended up being, in my opinion, uh, the most successful one-term president in terms of accomplishments because we did learn the salesmanship, but we did not that critical the first year. And it's the failures that oftentimes overwhelm the successes. Bill Galston, um, Stu Eisenstadt, and, and others have been talking about good policy not being enough. You've got to you know, have this uh, sales element uh, and the promotional part and, and the political uh, connection to your base as integral into the development of policy. Is that the way you see it? Well, um, of course, on one level. Uh, but you know, Bruce Reed said something that was so striking that I wrote it down almost verbatim uh, when, when, when he said that uh, uh, the task of government, of the president, is, you know, is not to pull the people where they desperately don't want to go, <laughs> you know, but rather to take them where they need to go and want to go. And that raises a very important question, which is a classic question of democratic governance. It points to one of the fundamental distempers of democracy. What happens where, 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 when the people need to go somewhere, 
but they desperately do not want to go there, <laughs> right? And, and that, it seems to me, is where there is an opportunity for presidential statesmanship of the highest order, but also for presidential failure of the highest <laughs> order. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that we can, all, we can all think of examples. And uh, you know, as adults, we've all been living through a period where president after president has been unable to persuade the people and take the people towards fir certain fundamental truths that would deal with certain fundamental underlying problems. Uh, and we may eventually or soon reap the whirlwind from that. So, uh, you know, I am, you know, I, I am really preoccupied with the question of how, you know, in a democracy, which is in many respects a populist democracy, which is driven more and more uh, by hyperpartisan media coverage one way or another. You know, I think Fox and MSNBC are the image of our awful future. Uh, you know, you know, I, was talking with, you know, I was talking with Bert Karp at breakfast this morning, and he said, you know, pretty soon we're not going to have news. We're going to have Democrat news and Republican news. I think we're heading strongly in that direction. How in these circumstances, you know, can a president more effectively close the gap between what the country needs and what the people want. Let me uh, just uh, come over here. Jim Pinkerton is sitting here quietly, but I can feel vibrations <laughs> coming from his chair. Um, is that the way you view this, the, the, the challenge? Well, I, I, I do sort of, a, I, I do agree with Bill, as I usually do, that, that cable news now has sort of conquered American politics in the sense that, you know, I mean, how much legislating and compromising goes on as opposed to talking points and getting on the air to make your blast against the opponent. And you know, the, the, all the various uh, gangs, of 17, 14, you know, I've lost the various numbers, those people tend to get pummeled you know, from their respective media, or, or not their respective, but the, from the various media corners out, out there and so on. So it, 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 it is a, a, a terrible challenge. I mean, whatever happened to, to use an old phrase, the vital center. I mean, that, that, it's hard to identify who's an establishmentarian anymore, because if you could identify him, he or she would get knocked off in the next primary. Um, and, I, and I will say, just in the spirit of lessons learned, that I, and I vehemently disagreed at the time, but now I do see the wisdom of a comprehensive energy policy that takes a look at things like oil imports and says, it's nuts to be spending, exporting hundreds of billions of dollars to our mortal enemies um, while shutting down nuclear power. I mean, I just, I think that, uh, that those issues deserve the kind, I mean, if there's ever a case where the, the vital center ought to get together and figure stuff out, it's energy policy. And nobody's dared to do that since Jimmy Carter. Uh, three quick points. Uh, one, uh, just a gloss on, uh, on Bruce's very perceptive point about taking the public where it wants to go. And that is a president can often, with the right salesmanship and organization, take the public where it didn't realize it wanted to go, but where it needs to go, and convince it that that is, in fact, where it wanted to go. And Bill Clinton was a, a master at, at doing that on welfare reform, for example. Second, Panama Canal was an example of a uh, instance where the public did not want to go in that direction. We had 25% support when we started to sell the Panama Canal Treaty, and this was an example of the proper integration of good policy, but one that was very controversial with excellent salesmanship. It was done with enormous public outreach, Margaret, with going into the country, going to swing states, getting Republicans, Kissingers, and others to validate this, um, and ultimately getting to a point where around 65% of the public supported it, and there was enough political cover so that at that point the public was convinced this was important for peace in Latin America and for our future. Third point, on the comprehensive energy package. Why did the Malay speech happen, and uh, was it uh, the unmitigated disaster that it is perceived to be today? It happened, Jim, because we had broken our pick on the first energy bill, getting a lot done, but with 18 months of pain, a second energy bill in 79, and then a third energy bill in 1980. And the president, when he came back 
from the uh, Tokyo uh, G7 summit, we had an energy speech ready for him to try to get the third energy bill passed. And he said, I've had it. The public has turned me off on energy. They've, they won't listen to me. I've got to step back and talk about what my entire presidency is about, or I'll never get anywhere on energy. And that led to the Camp David retreat with experts coming up and so forth. Now, there was as violent an argument as I've ever seen in any government in which I've been in between myself and Vice President Mondale on one side, Pat Cadell, Jerry Rafshoon, Jody Powell, and Ham Jordan on the other, about the Malay speech to begin with. I mean, I said, look, you, you can't cancel an energy speech and not give an energy speech. And people don't want to hear, Malay's, by the way, was never used. They don't want to hear a, a, a speech about the American spirit. They think we're the problem with double-digit inflation, not that they're the problem. The compromise ended up being giving this, this crisis of spirit speech and then saying the way to deal with this crisis of spirit is having an organizing principle, which is energy independence, and then putting that as a second part. The speech, contrary to my view and Mondale's, we were wrong, was an astounding success astounding success. That's not what is perceived now. It was an unbelievable success. Carter's poll shot up 25, 30 percent. We went out, I went out with him to Detroit right afterward to build on this, and it was like the good old days in 76. You'd have thought that there was a, a, a political resurrection. What killed the, the, the crisis of confidence speech was burying the headline, just as we were getting momentum, by the cabinet firing by firing the entire, or perceived to be firing the entire cabinet and squashing all the momentum that that speech developed. So again, it's a question of prioritizing things and of not trying to mix too many things at once. And, and that was the problem with the crisis of confidence speech, not the speech itself. Thank you very much. I want to uh, come to Bert Carper on, on an issue. Uh, you often hear presidential salesmanship. Uh, we're in the basketball season here, so uh, excuse me for the metaphor. but. It's often described as a kind of a bank shot. The presidents go out into the country. We see President Obama campaigning for health care reform, uh, as President Bush did on Social Security. Um, and the idea is that the president goes out, whips up, rallies, mobilizes Americans, and then members of Congress hear this and then become more supportive of the president's legislation. Now, there's another view about that, which is a little more skeptical, that members already have a view about good policy or concerned about their constituents or any number of other sorts of uh, reasons for, uh, for not being kind of bowled over by the president going around the country barnstorming. What's your view? Is, is kind of presidential promotion and salesmanship the way to win over Congress? I mean, each one of these things is different. I mean, one of the things I think we have to be careful of, if, if we identify the person who won the Virginia lottery last week, go and knock on their door and say, how did you win the lottery? They will tell you how they won the lottery. You know, I took this on my grandchildren's birthdays, divided by the square root of three. <laughs> you can't just necessarily go back and look at success, you know, and then say, well, you know, this, this, this produced that. These are really complicated and really hard. I mean, I, I believe that, that members of Congress are the most effective political polling organization, uh, 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 certainly that there is in this country. And, and they know what people think about the stuff we're trying to go. And if you can have public events that change those town meetings. So you went to one town meeting last week and the town meeting you go to this week is different. You should do it and you will see the difference on Capitol Hill immediately. If, on the other hand, you, you undertake a big public <coughs> promotional effort and it doesn't move the needle, then these guys who, who, they're different in many ways, but they're all completely focused on this, they will say, aha, public education did not move the needle here. And, and you can slide backwards quickly. Not so much because somebody will say, oh, I'll give a speech on the other side, because somebody will say, you know, this, instead of this being number two about the things I might think about that I might like to do, I think I'll just move this sucker back to number, back to number six. And so, I, I mean, I think it has to be, uh, uh, it has to be, uh, you, you, you take your life in your hands when you, uh, uh, when, when you, when you do these things, and, and if you can do it and make it work, you can, 
you can change the world, but if it doesn't work, you'll lose. You won't stay where you were. You'll slide backwards. Ms. Spelling. I, I just want to put, what, in my my experience, a finer point on that, and it is this: this toxic alliance that we sh see show up, that is the the uh, you know the culprit on why some of these hard things can't get done, and it's this toxic alliance between the unions and the you know arch conservatives, for for lack of a better word, and they. Uh, tend to team up for their own reasons on education, on immigration, on trade, on health, on welfare. And, you know, the town hall meeting happens and the members of Congress are an, an accurate polling uh, body because the people that show up at those things are members of the Toxic Alliance. And, uh, I mean, I, that just seems to be playing itself out kind of over and over and over, including right now on health care. Thank you very much. But Mr. Camp, let me just come to Mr. Camp. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, in light of this recounting of presidential successes, I think it needs to be said that uh, President Ford had uh, a low uh, record of success. And the reasons are fairly obvious. Uh, one, he didn't get elected, so he had no mandate. And more important, in uh, the election of 74, I think 40 seats in the House changed uh, hands, something like that. So he was confronted with a House that was two to one against him, and a Senate that uh, I believe he had 37 uh, Democrats. So um, he had uh, uh, tremendous uh, opposition. And furthermore, and uh, I think it's candid to say, he was not the best of salesmen for his programs uh, around the country. My judgment is that he was a first-rate manager of the White House after, after the first six or eight weeks. He learned how to manage the White House and did a very good job. But um, he, was, he, he, he never really succeeded in um, what uh, Stu and I have often talked about as a bully pulpit. He just was not, he was not very good. He didn't come across very well on television. He didn't... Um, he, he, he was a marvelous guy in the office to work with, but uh, put him on television and he looked, uh, he's exactly what he was, a kind of a dull Midwesterner <laughs> who uh, simply could not uh, project the quality of a, of a guy he was. And uh, the, uh, my own opinion is that about half the presidency is managing and about the other half is, uh, uh, is selling. and. Uh, Roger has uh, talked about how extraordinarily effective Reagan was, and, and he was. He was uh, effective for a lot of reasons. He had Jim Baker, who was uh, a master at negotiation. He had Ed Meese, who was uh, anchoring the right and protecting him, uh, whatever he wanted to do. And he had Mike Deaver, who presented him in these kind of uh, mini movies that uh, showed Reagan at his absolutely best. Uh, Reagan was a fascinating uh, uh, man. He, he would he would sit there and you you would think he was um, he, he's not going to be able to do this. But get him before that microphone and that camera, and he could perform. He could perform br brilliantly and sell uh, himself and wh whatever it was. There's another reason also that uh, uh, should be mentioned, I think, and you touched on it briefly, Roger that uh, he had a, a Republican Senate. And this was a very responsive Republican Senate. Howard Baker was the Senate Majority Leader and um, did an extraordinarily effective job of, uh, of uh, those first votes on the budget. And, um, and then uh, Reagan, him, President Reagan himself, was very effective at mobilizing the, the Republicans in the House and, a, and a, a, fracture, uh, a, fra uh, a degree, a number of uh, Democrats uh, in, in the House uh, from the South or whatever, and he could uh, get it done. Ford's major success really was in stopping the worst from happening. And I think he had uh, something like 67 vetoes and, oh, and uh, only seven were overturned. So he, he was... He, he had been very good on defense as a football player, and that's basically what he played. Uh, well, Mr. <laughs> Louis, but we need, to, we need to remember, with respect to Reagan, that there are really three phases of his presidency. 
The first was when he came in, and he had the wind in his back. He had won a big election. The Republicans had finally gotten control of the Senate. And he had a working majority in the House with the Bull Weevils. In the midterm 1982 elections, the Republicans lost 26 seats in the House of Representatives. And suddenly, that working coalition uh, in the House was gone. The tone of the negotiations totally changed. It was like a different presidency after the first two years. Then in 1986, the Republicans lost control of the Senate. Mm -hmm. And now you had both houses that were effectively outside of his control. When, what legislation comes to the floor at what time, et cetera. And it was a totally, again, different situation. Presidents can be effective spokesmen. Presidents can do a lot, but the context in which they face, I mean, Clinton is a classic example of someone who had a very different presidency after the loss of 50, 52, 53 seats. There was in plenty. The, but, <laughs> but, 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 but it's important to, you know, I just want to defend the American people here. Um, uh, Look, Reagan was a great communicator. He had the historical good fortune to get out before the consequences of some of his fiscal policies were, uh, became widely known. Bush paid a price for it. But the, uh, I think we should, one of the um, unfortunate consequences of the, of the Reagan era is that the political world began to think that, that, that politics was some kind of magic, that if you could talk to the American people the way Reagan did, that um, that's all that mattered. Um, and it isn't what, uh, the, the most important thing. The Americans are, are the most practical people, most results-driven people uh, on earth. And um, that can either work to a politician's benefit if he's able to produce good results, or it can be his undoing if, if his policies fail. And um, uh, we, we shouldn't get too enamored of the, uh, of the political pixie dust. Um, uh, it's very important to have a bond with the American people because, but, but it's, it's as, uh, as Bill and Stu both said, it's to, um, it's to enable you to be honest with them about where the country needs to go and figure out how far they can go towards that. Because there's no point in trying to take the country to a place that it won't go. Uh, they're the boss, they're gonna win in the end. Uh, the challenge is to, that, is to show them what the right thing for the country is and persuade them of that. If, you don't, if, you, if you're not doing that, um, and if your policies don't live up to that promise, then, um, uh, then you've never got a chance. Let, let's use a contemporary example, Larry. Um, President Carter, as part of his early energy package, tried to get a very modest gas tax passed as a conservation measure. President, Ray, uh, President Clinton, uh, Bruce, tried to get a BTU tax, which made all sorts of sense, and it would have been rebated back so it didn't cost anything and we'd have had it as a conservation measure. Here we are in 2009, in which our dependence on foreign oil is twice what it was when Richard Nixon said we were going to be energy independent in 1973 in 10 years. Here we are, more dependent than ever, here we are with the whole global warming issue. And, you know, most of us at this table, or at least some of us, would say, let's go back to that BTU tax. Let's have a 50 cent uh, gas tax so we can encourage people without the vagaries of oil. Let's do something that taxes the product we don't want to import and gives it back to the American people and puts the same money. And yet, no president's going to take that on at this point for the reason that Bruce mentions. There comes some point at which you simply know that the public is not going to listen. And if you try to break your pick on that again and again and again, you prevent yourself from doing maybe the next best thing, which is maybe a cap and trade program. So I think it's always a, it's always a very tough judgment call between what the right policy might be uh, and which has been tried and, and been found uh, publicly uh, unsuccessful, well, and, uh, and, and, you know, how much will the public get? So th th this is always a tension in the presidency. Time is our enemy, uh, <laughs> and, and it's my unhappy duty to call this fascinating discussion uh, to an end with great thanks to Stuart Eisenstadt, Margaret Spellings, Bruce Reed, Jim Pinkerton, and especially to Larry Jacobs.